Hi, welcome to this code rage session about the life of a public store application. Um, this is Marco Cantu, Rad Studio Product Manager at the Mercator Technologies. And the session I'm going to present is a little unusual compared to some of the other technical sessions at this uh, Code Rage 9 event, because rather than focusing on one specific area of application development with uh, Rad Studio, either Delphi or C++ Builder, the focus here is actually on going through real experiences, uh, real mistakes that I've made, and while well, suggesting you how to avoid them um, in building and publishing um, an actual app store, uh, an actual store app for mostly Android, because that's where the app has been successful but the same application works also on iOS and some of the tips are actually due to the uh, multi-device nature of the application. So some of the topics we'll look into is naming, advertising, distribution of extra files, status, web service versioning, uh, and there are actually a few more than, the, um, than listed here. The focus of this session is one specific application that I've built uh, with my son um, and his 10. Uh, actually, it was just barely 10 when we started it. The, the design, the idea, the um, description of how the application works is fully his. Um, I, I just was the developer uh, and just did what he uh, suggested and asked. Uh, that's why the application is a little strange in the behavior, and I'm going to show you the application uh, in a second. Uh, there isn't much action. Uh, the uh, short, short way of describing it is a patient game. You need a lot of time and a lot of patience to uh, proceed in the application. Basically, you have a list of Lego figures. Um, there are roughly 150 right now and you, every half an hour you can get a new one, either a new different one or, or you can have one duplicate. Uh, it's just a random uh, call. So it's very simple encoding terms. All of these figures are grayed out and then when you have them, you see them in full color. Uh, there are a couple of extra features like the ability to resell for gold and then use gold for uh, speeding up the development as long and you can also once a day get some extra gold from a gold mine. You can also trade online, um, although this helps at the beginning but then becomes more and more difficult to find online one of the uh, figures that you don't have uh, in your list. Uh, this started as a completely personal application. The idea was to give it to a few friends. Uh, it has topped 100,000 installations on Android although it hasn't still reached 100 on uh, iOS. And on weekend days, I'll show you a graph later on, on weekend days you can make uh, $10 on uh, advertising. So that's the uh, information. Now we can actually have a short look at the uh, website. This is how it is, how it looks, some of the screenshots and the, and the description of the application. What I want to show you is actually the application itself very shortly. It will highlight a couple of things that we'll discuss later. So let me start it. There is a splash screen, as you can see, followed by a second splash screen with a loading progress bar because loading all of these images in a grid uh, actually takes a little time. And now here are the images uh, in the grid. And you can scroll up and get to see this large collection of images grouped in, in different areas. Now, when there is one you don't have, and I have almost all of them, it's, it's shown grayed out. As you can see here, one of these um, Simpson images, although it's in this part uh, collection. Um, what else can you do? Well, as I was saying, you can actually Every half an hour, get a new figure. You get the um, box. You can click on it to open it up. And this is the new one I have in my collection. 
and then you have to wait another 29 minutes and 55, 53, 52 seconds to uh, get a new one. There is a notification option, so we're actually using notifications, so you can just close down the application, and in 29 minutes, you'll get notified, oh, there is a new uh, figure available. Um, the other thing you can do, if you have enough gold, and I do have six gold nuggets, you can actually speed up the figure by pressing on the button, and now you can actually get another one uh, right away. How you get gold? One option is to click 300 times on this guy, and I'm not going to do it because it takes quite a little bit of time. And the other option, if you go to the collection, what you can do, you can um, sell uh, one of your figures for gold. And the other option, you can trade online, is going to connect to the server, list you all of the images that are available on the server, and if there is one you don't have, you can click on it and, and trade it. That's it, that's all the uh, application does. So let's start looking into the tips that I have uh, collected during the development of this application. The first is naming. Uh, it's almost embarrassing to see how many applications have been published that have com.mercadero in their name. Now this is bad on iOS, but it's even worse on, you are on, on Play Store, on the Google Play Store, because as you can see, it, even in the URL, in the public URL for the application, it shows the um, domain name. Actually, it's the reverse domain name, but that's uh, an uh, identification mechanism that's used for uh, Play Store packages. Now, the same physical information is also on iTunes, but at least it's a little more hidden because the apps are referenced by name and ID rather than by uh, URL. Um, there is another side tip before I forget. It, on Android, if you upload too often, if you upload another version like in a week, uh, it will get a bit tricky because it won't let you upload an application before people have like got the intermediate version. It is technically possible to unpublish and republish, but it's really tricky. You should really make sure you've done all of the proper testing. And also on iOS, given you have to give reviewers times, if you re-upload, uh, they will beat you a bit. Or are you just fixing bugs in this upload? That's something they don't uh, want you to do. So going back to the naming, I just noticed that 75% of the apps on this list, on this page, actually have um, common Bracadero in their uh, in their list. And honestly, I, I, there's nothing I can say. I did that mistake every time I published an app. Uh, now you can unpublish them. Uh, but then even if the unpublished apps have zero users, have never been downloaded by anyone, there is at least no apparent way to remove them. So you keep having around the old versions, unpublished versions of your apps along with the actual uh, application. The thing I wanted to show you is this list of apps that was recently published. Now it's true that uh, it's easier to find on the Play Store uh, apps with that uh, tag, but how many have been published with the common Mercadero uh, in the in the name is really uh, a bit awkward. A side issue, uh, and then I'm going to show you the settings for those features. A side issue is versioning because the two worlds have two different models. Now on Android, what really matters is is the release number for the APK, for the physical file. They must be in sequence. There is a display version, 1.0, 2.0, 2.0, whatever. That's only for display. The real, ish, the real important thing is to have your release numbers as following consecutive, well, even not consecutive, you can have leave holds, but uh, following numbers for the APK release. So you are uploading version 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. On iOS, however, it's exactly the opposite. On iOS, what really matters is the major and minor 
uh, version number, so 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 2.1 follows, of course, 1.2, and so on. So the solution I found to try to bridge the two areas is to use major minor release as version number and have the major minor following a logical path. So you might go from 1.1 to 2.0, but the release being always um, uh, an increasing value. So for example, I would go from 1.0 to 8 to 1.1.9. And the last number would be the APK number for uh, on the Android world. These are set up, and here you can see both the configuration and the and the for the version the package name. So it's the package name on Android or the CF bundle name. You can spell out the entire name, or you can still use a dollar module name as an option, but make sure they replace com embarcadero with your with a domain you own. This this how your application becomes a unique reference to yourself. And you can see the version number. On one side, there is this version code, which in this example is 18. And then there is a version name 2.0.18 that's just typed into there. While on iOS, on the other side, the version is 2.0.18, and that's the full version name. And the bundle version is just um, an effect of uh, entering those numbers. Don't use the automatic version updates, numbering updates when you build because you're building way more often than you are going to release on the, uh, on the application stores. Again, when you do upload on the, the current APK has a version, which is the real number, and then among parentheses, the version description that you are using alongside. On the other side, uh, what matters is the true uh, version, although there is also a short version string, which is only um, major and minor version number that's also displayed on the uh, iOS store. Of course, what matters is that for specifically on iOS, you have to declare the version number and then upload a physical file that has the same matching uh, version number. Otherwise, the uh, upload would be rejected. So let's move to another topic. That's advertising. Um, it is as simple as dropping a banner ad. Um, you need to set a Google ID in the um, banner ad component. Uh, you can set it also for the iOS version. It's just going to be ignored. Uh, load the advertising. So that's quite straightforward. Although, um, again, on uh, specifically on Android, the Ad is a separate view, is a separate activity. So you cannot, it's not simple to have an ad on one location, on one page, in a different location, a different page. My suggestion is just to uh, put the same T banner ad object into each and every of your forms. And then when you load it, uh, provide there is enough space available on each of the forms by setting the proper height of the banner. As you load the banner, the banner ad placeholder will be uh, resized with the proper height, depending on your phone, on the ad, and whatever. So what you can do is resize the, the corresponding objects on all of your forms to the same uh, size of the first one, of the one you have actually loaded. Now things get a little more tricky if your main form can be a different form depending on the sequence the um, user goes through, but that's just a way to make a common shared um, method that resets your banner ads uh, on all forms. Uh, does it work? I mean, not working meaning technically, but meaning in terms of money. Uh, well, yeah, I have to say I was absolutely impressed by the uh, amount of money you can get with a rather simple, um, play application like, like the one I've built. Um, on, I, on iOS, it doesn't seem to be less effective. Of course, having a, an extremely smaller number of users, it's difficult to compare, but I consistently see that even the few ads that could be potentially displayed are not always filled. Uh, so there's not always a, an ad displayed when there is a position available. That's, that's not uh, the case on Android where there is a 100% fill of the uh, of the ads. 
Now there is AdMob available on iOS and that would probably be quite an interesting comparison, uh, although there is no direct support in FileMonkey, so you have to manually import the APIs and install your um, manually your AdMob uh, support for iOS. Uh, this is the advertising in action. Uh, one is at, is at the development edition, so you don't get ads in the development edition on iOS. You always get ads on uh, on Android. And this is the weekend effect I was mentioning on AdMob. Given the type of application, it actually does make some sense that kids that are not at school would use it more on weekends than uh, during the uh, during the school week. I had to say more than working week. So this is the effect. You can see that Saturdays and Sundays are uh, always peak uh, week after week compared to the rest of the week uh, for the advertising revenues. Uh, another issue I bumped into was the um, distributing resource files. Now the scenario is that this application has these 150 images. These are physical uh, JPEG or PNG files that are shipped along with the application. Uh, when I started, I just used the standard approach that uh, we recommend, um, which is putting them in the documents folder and then loading uh, from the documents folder um, from either uh, iOS and Android using slightly different code, but there is support uh, right into the IO utils for getting the proper, uh, the proper folders. Um, at the beginning, that was fine. Um, I could get it started, but then I uh, hit a roadblock on iOS. Uh, on iOS, you're not allowed to store a lot of documents. And in my case, it's, I think it's five megs uh, worth of images. You're not allowed to store more than a few doc a few files um, as documents. Uh, the reason is that application documents are backed up on iCloud. So if something is distributed with the application and not subject to change, it should not be uh, within the application document. So like a database file would make sense. It has to start small, um, otherwise we'll incur in the same restriction, but then it can grow and it will be back backed up, which is good. But as uh, fixed images like this, honestly don't don't make sense as documents don't need to be backed up they can be redownloaded along with a new version of the application so the suggestion i read in number of places will actually use the library folder uh, so i tried and make a new version using the library folder and it was also rejected because again even the library folder is backed up on icloud so the suggestion i got is oh just place them in the application bundle now it took me a little to figure out exactly what does that mean in um, Rad Studio development terms? And it turns out all you have to do is to deploy to the root, deploy to slash uh, as um, target. Now then the next issue became, how do I load applications if I don't know where that folder is, where the application itself is? Uh, turns out there is one way to know where the application folder is, which is look at the application executable name on um, iOS and that's you guess what the first uh, command line parameter you receive from the application so again for Android I just deployed to use to the standard assets internal there's no automatic backup there's no big deal in using this approach and I load from uh, get documents path from uh, iOS I deploy on uh, dot slash and I load from uh, param string zero as the, um, well, the file path of param string zero, which is the executable name of the application. Executable name and executable path of the application. A very, very old fashioned trick, but I have to say it worked very smoothly and the application was approved on the um, I, um, App Store with this change. Another issue I've actually blogged about quite a bit in the past is the resource loading time and splash screen. Now the application loads 150 images. It takes time. Uh, no matter what, no matter how you speed it up, no matter if you optimize it, um, loading 150 images at runtime in a grid is not a trivial half a second operation on, on a phone. Uh, it takes a few seconds, not many, but it takes a few seconds. So what I did is I created um, 
splash screen, I created a form that um, is loaded automatically. This is the only form that's automatically created on application start uh, when the project starts, and that takes considerably little time to, to do. And then what this uh, main form does, it turns on a timer, and when the timer fires, I'm actually loading the following uh, forms, the secondary forms. There is more than one, only one is really slow, but just in case I moved all secondary forms to this delayed loading. Uh, now, it would have been better to use a background task or a background thread. That's something I'm going to consider for the future, but for now it um, works well enough for, for my needs. Um, so what happened is that you immediately see something, you immediately get the splash screen rather than a blank screen. Uh, and then what, what I also added, given it was this, this screen was displaying for quite a bit, is I added a progress bar, as you might have seen in the uh, first part of my demo. And the progress bar um, goes from 100 to 0 to 150 and progresses when a new image is, is being loaded. So it's a real feedback, it's a real significant feedback of the loading time for those, uh, for those images into the uh, string grid. What I did add also, uh, I already had it on iOS, I also added a real splash screen for Android using the, um, the available feature in the IDE for XC7. Notice that this is not an alternative to using the initial splash form because what happens on Android is that you get a splash screen, then you get a blank screen while the main form is created. You still get that split second um, and then you get something to display. Now it's a split second if the first form is fast to create, otherwise it will be a long time uh, blank screen. So you still need the splash form for a slow startup, like consider a, a main form that has database data or needs to fetch data from remote or load images or do anything that's far from a trivial initialization. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that the IDE for Android allows only horizontal splash images. Of course, you have more flexibility. There is a way to have images with nine tiles that gets compiled and auto-sized properly. Given that my application is vertical only, it doesn't actually display on um, uh, horizontally. It's a vertical only app, it's a portrait mode only app. So what I did was just load a um, random splash screen with the proper sizes, and then I did replace the physical PNG file that I had referenced from the IDE with a vertical one. Uh, that, that works because when you load in the IDE, it creates the proper XML configuration files for the splash screens, and then if you could replace it, replace the, vertical, the horizontal image with the vertical image, that's what's going to ship with the application, and it works pretty smoothly with no real stretching or skewing. Uh, at runtime. So I found that was um, actually a nice workaround to the current scenario. Another area I, that took me a little to fully understand and figure out was saving status. There is status information like the last time you got an image, the how many gold nudges you have and a few other things. That's saved in the application folder on iOS. I ended up uh, saving on a shared external on Android that turned out to be a significant mistake because there are Android devices that don't have the shared external unless you have um, a secondary SD card or have the shared external mapped to some very odd driver names that are not the standard by the operating system. So I really recommend against using shared external. Uh, I had it in my app, now it, I have it double. So it will either use share external if you already have the configuration file or default to uh, an application document folder. Now the other side to consider is what happens with the format change. So you update version, you go version from version, you might need more data to be saved. It's very important that you do all of the, uh, you do some testing on all of the various options. You might be tempted to test only on your phone and your phone has the last available version, but there might be users that skip versions, skip one version or just install the new version without having ever installed a previous one. So you have to make sure to, to test in the various scenario. Uh, there was one point that I 
my the application when updating from one given version to another one, like skipping a couple, it will just crash because I didn't do the proper testing for that scenario. And um, it actually was quite bad because people were complaining and couldn't really move uh, to to that ver to that new version. So testing becomes difficult when you have many alternative options. Uh, and what I did is basically using um, the file size, or actually I keep I, I read some a few integers, a few numbers, and then I check if I'm at the end of the stream, I'm on an older version. If there's still more data saved in the settings file, then it means I'm on a, on a newer version of the uh, of the status. And of course, then I save the 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 full version, padding with zeros or whatever, to uh, complete the scenario. Uh, another thing I bumped into is the, initially I created a web service. The web service is used for trading online. So there are basically two comments in the web service. One is give me a list of the um, figures cu currently on the server, and then you can trade one for another. Um, the issue is that um, after a while I did change the uh, format that's returned. I'm returning more data. I, I made the... Um, the, the store bigger and then the older application will just crash and what I completely failed to do in the in the first round of this web service is adding a versioning call that basically has the concept of I ask for the version if the version doesn't match I'm just telling hey I cannot you cannot use this application for trading anymore you have to upgrade to a new version of your application uh, the first time I failed to do that testing, so I still have the server for version one of the online trading that has to be kept up and running because there are still a few thousand users on that older version of the uh, application. So that's something you really have to plan and put a lot of care into because otherwise you'll get stuck. You'll have to keep some servers uh, up and running in older versions like in uh, and for, forever because there will never be uh, a point where there is no one on uh, a, a given old version of your uh, application. We still have people, like a thousand people of the first release version that was released almost uh, a year ago with like probably 10 or uh, 11 versions uh, in between. Speaking of updates, uh, there is one thing that, uh, again, you uh, I, I found by experience. Um, it is at one point, when we started doing the online trading, I added the uh, internet permission to the application because that's what I needed to do the online trading. Now, there is a very significant slowdown in updates on Android when you add extra permissions because the way it works is most people have their Play Store uh, set up with automatic updates. So you release a new version, uh, people get a notification, the Play Store just automatically updates the new version and everything gets very smooth and you have, you can have um, a 50, 60, 70 percent upgrade rate in within a week from people on the on the previous version. Now, if you add even one minor extra permission, the automatic process gets stuck and the users will have to open the Play Store, open the application, approve the extra permission and then do the upload. So when you do that, you would get something like a 10, 15 percent upgrade rate within the same week time frame, and then a lot of users will actually never move on and get remain stuck to that to that version. Uh, so that's a significant issue. Uh, my suggestion is to try to add to consider at the beginning the permissions you might need in the future. Uh, and add an extra more than you really need right now, just in case, because it will be easier for people to approve the extra requirements at the very beginning than to add them through the manual uh, update process. This is not an issue on iOS, because on iOS, permission as are asked as needed. So when you do the API call, you get the permission request, and not it's not an upfront requirement of the application. So it's a completely different scenario, but on Android, changing the permissions or asking for more permissions is something that will slow down the uh, update rate very significantly. So conclusion, 
uh, mobile offers an unprecedented distribution opportunity. Uh, again, my experience, I was planning to use only, to give it only a few friends. We got uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people uh, who downloaded this pretty simple and, and, and limited uh, application. Um, it's very interesting in monetization. Uh, again, my initial goal was to uh, tell my son, oh, let's put an ad and we'll share the money. You'll be able to buy one of these small Lego boxes or a couple of minifigures. He can probably buy some of the largest Lego boxes ever with, uh, with the money we're making. And um, yeah, there is a lot of complexity. There are lots of hidden details. It's not just the pure development um, as in the desktop platforms where you have full control of the life of your application, which is good on one side, but it's also bad because it means you have to handle the distribution and the advertising and everything else by yourself. Here you can have an incredible power. The distribution opportunity really comes from the application stores, but they also put a lot of burden and I haven't even mentioned um, signing applications, uh, signing all of the paperwork and doing all of the more formal and, and, uh, and, and then, then technical requirements that are honestly quite well documented elsewhere. So my goal was mostly to guide you through real um, discoveries that I made during this development process and uh, my wish is you'll be able to produce uh, successful apps uh, with Delphi and C++ Builder and a method and put them on the app store and um, make a lot of money either by selling the applications or uh, advertising in there. Uh, that's all and let's... So your your app is free, do you, you offer in-app purchase or just advertising? Uh, no, there is, there is nothing to buy, although there is the concept of having gold within the um, within the application. So in theory, we could add some way to sell these gold nuggets to speed up the, the, the figures, but it it's, hasn't happened so far. It's driven by advertising and the money that is flowing through advertising is actually quite significant. So have you considered adding the ability to purchase turning off ads? Uh, no, not exactly. The ability, we, we thought more about adding the ability to um, to buy these gold nuggets as, as an extra. Cool. Sure, sell them, sell them something they can keep ads on too. <laughs> um, so some questions here. You don't charge for the game. The game's free. The um, one question came up about the Apple announcement for 64-bit binary requirements after February. Not really uh, related yeah, to your... We are actively working on the issue because we know that um, it's a very relevant change from the uh, from the Apple side um, we'll make available uh, uh, an update or a way to um, to get applications in the in the in, in the app store by that time okay and let's see it says I have published on Apple Store incrementing only ver release version eg from 7.0 point one to seven point oh point two and it works but I have to modify manually the uh, CF bundle short version string to be identical with CF bundle version in the info.p list because IDE cuts it to seven point oh so yeah that that's a good suggestion I, I still tend to prefer my model where I upgrade the minor version and then also upgrade the final release version so it stays in sync from the uh, Android and the uh, iOS side. It's, it's not that you have to keep them in sync. You can use whatever number uh, on each platform, given that, again, the, the, the way versioning works on the two platforms is, is quite different. Right. But for simplicity, if you can just refer to a version by a single name throughout platforms, that's quite handy. Yeah, I, I see definitely some advantage of that to keeping them unique or uh, the same across platforms. Especially since, I mean, with people using non, not using Delphi, then they have to rewrite, you know, if they write the, add a feature on iOS and they have to go add the feature on Java and add the feature on Android. So since we can release one executable on both platforms and that makes it really easy to keep those in sync. Yeah, absolutely. That's the point. I mean, if, if taking advantage of the, of the single source and the application is fully single source, 
um, there is only this if that for the um, where you load the the, the information. Yep. Um, yeah, it makes sense to be able to just have a, a synchronized versioning and and settings and just build for the two stores and deploy to the two stores in sync. Is there a function call to uniquely identify a device? Uh, no, I don't think that's an easy, easy task. Um, I know that is easier on uh, Android, but it's kind of tricky on iOS. There are some restrictions on the way you can refer to devices that change or have changed depending on the iOS version. I don't know the exact details, but I don't think that's um, exactly a very simple thing to do. Not that I needed it for, for this kind of app, though, of course. Uh, does Embarker, do we have a list of iOS-based apps in the App Store? I guess made with uh, Delphi. Uh, there are some lists floating around. I, there's, we do have uh, some applications uh, on the application showcase uh, that includes both VCLs and also some of the mobile ones. Yeah, there's nothing like official or, or, or a complete list. And also what happens mostly is that most of the nice applications we have uh, we have actually seen um, are actually applications that uh, are been built and deployed internally in companies like point of sale, warehouse management, and, and things that don't end up into, into stores. What about in-app sales? Uh, I haven't personally tried it. I know there are demos that we ship and there are uh, other developers who have built um, apps with um, in-app purchase options. We do have components that make it um, relatively simple to do both on iOS and Android, uh, but uh, I, it's not something I've personally, I've personally built. Um, one of the reasons is that um, I would have been a little worried um, about, I mean, this is really like a side project doing in the weekends with my son. And um, if you sell something, then people will, of course, if something doesn't work, file complaints. And I don't know, I think it needs just a little bit of extra support ability to, to be able to actually sell something rather than, okay, you watch some advertising, whether you like it or not, which is the current model. Uh, so we got a couple of reports of people losing their collections of images. If you end up like, crashing and deleting the file with the storage that might happen. Uh, again, after you've paid some money, uh, of course, it would be your, your right to uh, require uh, some support. And that's something I don't really plan uh, offering. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it is a good point that you really have to, if you're going to have a uh, app store app, you really need to make sure that you're ready to commit to it. It's like committing to a relationship or something like that almost. <laughs> yeah, and, and if it's free, there is some commitment, but if it is a paid application or you paid in-app purchase, then the commitment becomes significantly higher because they really become your customers in full. So yeah, again, for this type of project, I, I don't really want to uh, move it up to that level. I believe we have a, there, yeah, we do ship a demo that shows a uh, like a state's quiz, I think it is, that um, has in-app purchase. I think that's actually in the app store. And you can... Yeah, you can buy extra things in the, in the, uh, for the states, uh, extra questions, whatever that means. Uh, the other app that was floating around was um, the uh, clock that Anders Olson did in Monkey, And this had uh, advertising, and you could buy the removal of advertising through in-app purchase. That's right. That's right. I remember that. That's what I was thinking of. For some reason, I was thinking that was your yours apps, but that's with Anders. No, no, no. That was Anders' clock that, um, that is actually, I think it is still in the stores, and you can um, yeah, pay to re get rid of the, of the ads. So John suggested that we put a warning in when someone uses com.embarcadero. Maybe when they build for release or something like that. I don't know. But... Uh, that could be an option, or we could also avoid having the default. But then again, the application will, it's some information you need to put in there. So, um, and most other tools, when you create a new application, they make you walk through a wizard where you have to name everything and select stuff. And which is, it's fine when you're ready to publish it, but when you're just making a real quick test, it's like, ah, quick, just be done. 
Yeah, yeah, it can get a bit in, in the way. I mean, in, my, in many cases for internal development, I mean, who cares what the what the physical name of the of the of the APK reference is? It's only when you go to the app store that it becomes relevant. And it's no, and it's yeah, it's a different target. So maybe there are ways internally to like prompt uh, for that information at the right time. But so there's a question here: If you don't sell the app, how do you get the uh, user history and know how many users you have and stuff. Oh, there is a lot of analytics in the um, in the uh, Play Store, so you can actually see how many users downloaded uh, over time, uh, their upgrade rate, which version operating system, country they are in, and which phones they are using. So there is a lot of user analytics. Although so it's not individual, you can track the individual person because it's more. Uh, general analytics, but the amount of information that's available uh, is actually uh, quite significant. So Alf's asking if um, you can use Embarkador or AppWave to distribute iOS and Mac and Android apps as well as Windows apps. Alf's asking if we have any plans for, if there's any plans for a substitute app store, maybe for in-house distribution. There are a lot of third parties that do that, but I don't, Know that that's anything we've announced plans for? No, I actually just learned that Windows is planning to have um, actually multiple. Uh, Microsoft is planning to have multiple options for distributing packages and apps in the Windows 10. But in terms of um, in terms of mobile spaces, um, I mean, it's it's it will be very difficult to get something else in place compared to the uh, Play Store for Android and, and the App Store for uh, iOS. Well, on iOS, that will be pretty illegal and technically very difficult as well. Well, there's there's um, there are app stores that do in-house distribution for iOS through enterprise licensing. Yeah, that's 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 something you can set up for almost more for most of these in, in operating systems is to have corporate or enterprise stores that for, for internal distribution, uh, but it's different from having something public. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, iOS doesn't allow, to, allow you to have a public uh, distribution channel, except their app store. App store on OS 10, Apple has an app store on OS 10. Do we support apps in that as well, correct? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there has been some recent change that are giving a, giving some headaches. Um, I'm actually, in, I think I heard something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where we are in terms of um, supporting that. Uh, and again, it happened at the same time. Uh, Apple changed some of the rules for for iOS, and we currently are, are providing a beta for a new linker for for that issue. It'd be nice if there was one app store that could you could go to that had apps for all platforms, but um, that's not going to happen since Apple kind of locks their platforms down. Yeah, and actually, you should either ask Microsoft or Google, not not a Mercadero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be something that someone else like that would do. It's a little beyond and above what we can do as a company, honestly. Yes, and uh, well, unfortunately, most of, well, some other people do do cross-platform development, they just keep developing the apps into different platforms. Um, fortunately, not everybody has the advantage of uh, single source app development for multiple platforms. So, uh, Alan's asking if there's any plans to update HTML5 Builder in the near future. Not really at the moment. We will do maintenance and support new version of libraries, but not really brand new features. Uh, in the product. That's that's the current scenario. It can change any time, but that's what's currently on the table. 